A good day to you, my dear young theologians, students of uh, Don Bosco School of Theology, and I welcome you to our class, Introduction to Biblical Geography. I would have wanted to do a face-to-face -face class. I would see that that would be more interesting, but I believe that this would uh, also suffice given the situation that we have. And uh, today's topic will be the following, not only the introduction to biblical geography, but also to the ancient Near East, the Fertile Crescent, and a survey of biblical history. I'd like to begin this with a prayer, and I invite everybody, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. We offer to the Lord all our endeavors today, that we may understand His Word, and in studying his word, we may appreciate that he came to us in space and time. And so we glorify him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. St. John Bosco, may every help of Christians, name the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I have given you already the outline of our course. And in that outline, we see that it's divided into five phases. I, could not, uh, I would not say that they are modules because uh, there are some parts that are longer than the others. But this is one major part, the first one. And this is the introduction to biblical geography. And the... Uh, what we will study today is about the Fertile Crescent and then a swift survey of biblical history. So here it is. Okay, one question that I, we ask is, what is geography? What are we studying here? And the National Geographic uh, places this in one of their pages. What is geography? And they would answer in this manner. Geography is the study of places and the relationships between people and their environments. Geographers explore both the physical properties of the Earth's surface and the human society spread across it. They also examine how human culture interacts with the natural environment and the way that locations and places can have an impact on people. Geography seeks to understand where things are found, why they are there, and how they develop and change over time. So when we do study geography, it's uh, not just confined to something biblical. Uh, when uh, it's, a, it's a broader uh, set of knowledge that we have, and Perhaps in the past, we have met this in our previous studies. Well, uh, what is the etymology of that, of the word geography? It's from the Greek. I'm sure you're taking, ah, okay, you'll be taking Greek next semester with Father Jin Lingad, I presuppose. But uh, it's from the Greek, geographia. And literally, it's earth, earth description. Uh, further from the etymology, that's the, the article, hey, gay, or uh, the genitive is gays. So it's earth. And then the other one is grafe, hey, grafe, grafes. It's, it means writing. So writing about the earth, description about the earth. And so geography is the study of the main physical features of an area, its resources and its climate. The study that we will have is more specialized in the sense that we will be dealing not generically with geography, but we will be dealing with the geography of the Bible. And our motivation in studying biblical geography is, since God's revelation happened in space and time, it is important to get acquainted with the places of the peoples of the Bible. Coming to know biblical geography, we would understand better when we read portions of the Bible, and that's why this subject is an auxiliary subject. It helps us with the other subjects. 
and you will have a lot of subjects in sacred scripture. And we begin with the ancient Near East. And uh, it's very interesting to note that, yeah, uh, what we call now the Middle East, much of that is uh, what was known as the ancient Near East. It may not be recognizable in this uh, map that is there that introduces this topic, but yeah, actually, it's uh, this is the ancient Near East, that part. And going on further to illustrate this, uh, the ancient Near East in the second millennium BC. Here we use BC before Christ. And many times in the books that I would recommend to you, uh, we see BCE, that is before the common era. While the AD, which is which we take as Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, uh, we usually see it as CE or the common era. I think this is to be more inclusive with regard to peoples of other people of other faith. But anyway, here it is. Uh, the, the ancient Near East with the empires that uh, we know of in history. The Hittite Empire, the Mitanni, the Assyria, and then Babylonia, and then of course the Egyptian Empire. And uh, they are huge ones. And so our uh, the Holy Land is dwarfed there, although it plays a very important role in the history of the ancient Near East. So here's another focus on the, the different empires in the ancient Near East. Okay, now, in the olden times, many ancient people lived in fortified city-states. When we hear of city-states, what comes to our mind is uh, the Greek culture. When we hear of uh, Aristotle and Plato and the... Uh, they speak of the city-state. And there are four criteria determined, that determine their location. How come they flourish in a certain place? These are the four criteria. One, agriculture. The question is, was the land fertile enough? Second, the economy. Was there possibility for trade and commerce? Three, communication. Was it near roads or waterways? You know, there's a correlation between that. No? You are able to deliver messages if you're near roads or waterways. And then strategic. Was the place defensible? So very important uh, criteria. For example, just with, uh, with regard to strategic location, we, we know that Jerusalem does not uh, have all the resources that uh, other cities would have. But then its plus factor is its strategic position. So you would see there, uh, it's there on top of the hill. And uh, you see there Herod's Palace or the, the citadel here in this area. And then we have the Hinnom Valley, which is uh, somehow a, a trench that's, uh, that makes it hard for them to penetrate Herod's palace. And then we have the central valley. We have the temple here. And then another valley that separates it from the Mount of Olives. And here we have water source, the Gihon, Gihon Springs. And there's a natural bedrock here, the city of David, which is uh, right now the, the subject of uh, a lot of, a lot of archaeological excavations. Well, archaeology we will take in the next part after geography. But anyway, it's a very interesting topic that we have here, that uh, cities are built also because of their, of the strategic location of a place. And then one thing important also is, are the rivers. You know, uh, maybe you've studied in history that many of the cities that we have, they have flourished because they're along the river. Just uh, mention those are major cities in the world right now, even here in the Philippines. Manila became, Manila flourished because of the Pasig. And of course, now you cannot imagine it uh, to be flourishing because of the Pasig. No? But uh, in the olden times, yes. 
and in the others uh, you see the the Danube and the in Rome the Tiber in France the the Thames in Florence the Arno and so on and so forth so in these four in the four criteria that we've seen rivers played an important role so about for farming agriculture rivers were needed for irrigation and then they could serve as channels for trade more often than not a means of transportation before were through the river and the rather than the roads and these were convenient arteries of communication also as well as for mobilization in times of need and it is no wonder then that most ancient sites were located beside rivers and there is no exception not to the ancient Near East where we see rivers. Just uh, to a mnemonic device, okay? Uh, remember net, okay? The internet. Uh, in order to know which uh, river is uh, from the east to the west. So we have three main rivers. Three rivers stand out in the ancient world. And I'll point these to you. So we have... Here in uh, Egypt, we have the Nile. See this part there. And then we have also the Euphrates, this part. And then we have the Tigris. So N E T. Okay. So these three rivers, two are in Mesopotamia, the Euphrates and the Tigris. And the Nile is in Egypt. So they stand out. And the earliest civilizations actually thrived on these rivers. Okay, let's see first the Nile. So we have the Nile, the longest and most majestic of all the rivers. It traces its origins from the melting snows of Kilimanjaro which is in Africa, and the, the Nile's constant ebb and swelling made it ideal for agriculture. On its fertile banks grew ancient Egypt with the old kingdom's capital in Memphis and the new kingdom centered in Thebes. So there's the Nile. And then you have the Delta also. The Nile, when it uh, goes out into the sea, it forms the delta. You know what a delta is? Uh, you call it delta because it's shaped like the Greek letter delta. And I'd like to draw that for you. So the Greek letter delta is like this, the triangle. But see here, it's uh, an inverted delta. The delta here. Okay, in another map here. So that's the Nile Delta. And you know, uh, that's where we find a lot of uh, great cities of Egypt, including Alexandria. Now to the east are found two great rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. In the land between them grew the civilizations of Mesopotamia. That's why you call it Mesopotamia. It's in the middle of two rivers, Meso and then Potamos is a river uh, two, between two rivers or between the rivers. And so you see there are civilizations of the Sumerians, the Mari, the Akkadians, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians. And each having its own time in the limelight of history that we will see later. Now these were the two poles of power in the ancient world. The kingdom, the Egyptian kingdom to the west, and here is the Egyptian kingdom, and then the Mesopotamian power in the east. And the land between them was their buffer zone. So what is between them? This area. Connecting both the trade routes along which cities grew. Now, the two most major of these trade routes were the Via Maris. And here's the Via Maris. It passes 
near the sea. So it comes here from Damascus and then along the sea, along the shore. And it goes to Egypt in Memphis. And then the other one is the King's Highway. It was more inland. So you find it here. The King's Highway. Here. Okay. Now you would see that in Scripture. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 17, we see, Now let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from any well. We will go along the king's highway and not turning aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. See that king's highway. And when you find that, when you take the Pentateuch, you would already know what it is. Okay? The king's highway. And then in, uh, regarding highway, that's already a term. Of course, uh, highway is in English, but that's already a term that was used before, referring to more or less the same thing. A road which is wide and where you can go fast. That's why in Isaiah 40, verse 3, we hear, A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the des in the desert a highway for our God. And so you see there a modern uh, rendition of the highway right there in the uh, bottom right-hand corner. Now, these, there are certain places that are mentioned in the Bible that somehow are along the path of these uh, highways, of these important routes. So one is Megiddo. You see it here, and uh, you see there a uh, replica of the biblical Megiddo. I've been there once, and uh, it, it's still in the process of being excavated. There are a lot of findings at Megiddo, a very important uh, part. The other one is Hazor, which is here in the north, and you see here excavations also from Hazor, and uh, part of that is uh, this artifact that has been excavated from it. No? If you would study Hazor, I think that's a, a very interesting uh, thing to look at, especially here in our study of archaeology. I'll tell you more about that later on. And uh, about Megiddo, we know it from the Bible, 2 Kings 23, 29. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates. See, Euphrates is mentioned there. King Josiah went to meet them, but when Pharaoh Necho met him at Megiddo, he killed him. So Josiah met his death, one of the great kings, one of the good kings of Israel. He met his death at Megiddo. And of course, it's also mentioned, alluded to in Revelation, in fact, explicitly mentioned in the book of Revelation. And they assembled them at the place that the Hebrew, in Hebrew is called Armageddon. You've heard a lot about that word, Armageddon, okay? the mountain of Megiddo. And the seventh angel poured his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. So, uh, this part of the ancient Near East, it's also called the Fertile Crescent. Because most of the ancient world ancient Western civilization could be found along this cradle or corridor of the power, the area is more commonly called the Fertile Crescent, or more technically, the Ancient Near East. So it's synonymous. The Ancient Near East, okay, uh, a part of that is the Fertile Crescent. So you, we, when we talk about the Ancient Near East, understandably, they are the, those that are covered by the Fertile Crescent. And you know why it's called Crescent? Look. Okay, I'll just point this out. Here, it's a Crescent. Okay. Now, the Fertile Crescent. This area is also called the Fertile Crescent because of its fertile land. Okay. Other terms for it, Levant. Okay, that's the geological usage. Also, the Jordan Rift Valley or Syria-Palestine, you also call it that way. At times, 
entire coastlands from Greece to Egypt. Okay, so you would uh, know, uh, you would be reading such terms. And in it, the seven major agricultural products prized in the ancient world were cultivated. Wheat, barley, vine, fig, pomegranate, olive, and dates. Which of these have you not seen yet or have you not tasted yet? Wheat, we always meet it in, uh, when we eat bread. Okay, of course, it has already been uh, processed. Also, barley, you know, when we drink beer and uh, also... Uh, we, we know what grapes are and we know what wine is. Olive oil also. Figs. I've eaten fresh figs when I was in the Holy Land. And the, you must have uh, tasted that also, uh, albeit uh, dried. And then pomegranate. That's a very refreshing drink in the Holy Land. And then, of course, dates, which you can eat dried. Most of the time we know dates that are dried also. Uh, I was able to taste fresh fig, fresh uh, dates uh, when I was in the Holy Land. Okay, now, this is very interesting. You know why? This is called the Gezer calendar. When I uh, printed, or when I uh, made your, uh, that course outline, and then I put there the dates, under calendar, you might be wondering, what is, why is this calendar? Because it's the Gezer calendar, so it's a tablet, okay, a Hebrew inscription, and then uh, look at the one in the right now, you would see it uh, more clearly. Of course, uh, I don't know if you would understand it. It's not even, it's a Greek script, it's not in the modern one that we see, the more modern uh, uh, Hebrew, I mean Hebrew, that's uh, more familiar to you. So the Gezer calendar was from the 10th century BCE, so before the Common Era, that is BC, before Christ as we know it. Okay, It's a Hebrew inscription of seven lines engraved on a limestone tablet written in ancient Hebrew script discovered in Gezer by R.A.S. McAllister in 1908. And the Gezer calendar is dated by its script to the 10th century BCE and cites an annual cycle of agricultural activities that seem to begin with the month of Tishri. Don't worry about that yet, but uh, at least you have uh, something in mind about this, this artifact that has been discovered. And it reads, very much related to what we're studying now about the uh, plants, about the fruits or uh, the produce of the land. His two months are olive harvest. His two months are planting grain. His two months are late planting. His month is hoeing up of flax. His month is harvest of barley. His month is harvest and feasting. His two months are vine tending. His month is summer fruit. And you find that in a source that uh, scholars are using, the, what you call anet or the ancient Near Eastern texts. It's uh, number th 320. So when you see this, you already know that it's the Gezer calendar. Now, the major agricultural products, wheat is processed into flour. Barley, barley bread was the bread of the poor. Now it's made into beer. Vine, grapes were processed into wine. Although we, we also love eating grapes. And then fig. Of course, these are delicious fruits. But in the Bible, to sit under the vine and the fig tree was a symbol of peace. Micah 4.4 4 and 1 Maccabees 14.12. And eventually it became associated with the coming of the Messiah. John 1.48. Uh, that, that encounter between Jesus and uh, Nathaniel. I saw you under the fig tree. And then pomegranate featured in architecture, in the capitals, and ritual objects to symbolize fertility. In Jeremiah 52, 22 to 23. And then olive, of course, it's the greatest export of Israel. 
the, uh, it's made into oil, olive oil. Now, very a terrible part of uh, the history of Israel. To punish the Jews, Hadrian had all the trees within 15 kilometers of Jerusalem cut down. So it's a pity. And uh, included in that, of course, are the olive trees at the time of Jesus, the Mount of Olives. So what do we see there now? They're not really uh, as old as Jesus, although they're really old trees there. And then dates from which honey, quote-unquote, was processed. Because uh, it was known, Exodus 3.8, land flowing with milk and honey. So very interesting. And you know, uh, Israel's exports, if we look at Ezekiel 27.17, Judah and the land of Israel traded with you, Tyre. They exchanged for your merchandise, wheat from Minith, millet, fruit honey, olive oil, and balm. And the land's best products were brought by Joseph's brothers as gifts to Egypt. In Genesis 43:11. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry them down as a, pre as a present to the man. A little balm and a little honey, gum, resin, pistachio nuts, and almonds. And here you find in Deuteronomy 8, 7 to 8, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground rivers, waters, welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey. So you see, this, is, uh, this subject is very important also because we see in the Bible, uh, the texts that relate these products of the land. And then Exodus, what do you find? I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, at the middle of all this, of what we were talking about a while ago, of those uh, routes that are very important, and then uh, those two powers, Egypt and the Mesopotamian powers, at the middle of all this was the land of Canaan, from which the promised land of Israel would come, as what we have just read. Now, although it's not blessed with great natural resources, it always remained a bone of contention for whoever was in power. It was a strategic location. And whoever controlled this little strip of land controlled the highways for trade and commerce. Taxes no, are in their minds. Its strategic physical location became Israel's boon. They were lucky for it, but also bane because they were the ones who suffered because of the problems or the that uh, those bickerings, not only bickerings, but those uh, battles and the wars between the their neighbors who were great empires. Now let's see. Uh, the land is seen as God's gift. In First Kings twenty-one two to three. Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my place. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So what do you see there? That the land is a gift. And you see here, this is the land. Of Israel, I would ask you to memorize how to draw the land. Just make uh, this slope a bit of a pinch here. This is Mount Carmel and then down the coastline. And then you find here the Sea of Galilee and then the Dead Sea below. 
and then the Jordan River that links them. And you see here the different tribes. But uh, here, what do we find? A very important uh, part. The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So that's uh, a very important thing to them. That's why in the Jubilee year, what is uh, one of the precepts? The return to the land. Now, in Judges 21, we read, Then all the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead come out as one, as one man and assembled before the Lord in Mitzpah. So that's how they view the land. Where, where are the boundaries? When they say uh, from the north to the south, it's from Dan to Beersheba. Okay, so you've seen that part. And here also we see something very important. This is about Abraham and the Fertile Crescent. Now the earliest identifiable place names of the Bible are those connected with Abraham. And this is uh, very familiar to us before the beginning of uh, chapter 12, and that is Genesis 11:31. The earliest... Uh, we read that Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. So you see here some place names. So you see Haran. And then you also see Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans, and then going to the land of Canaan. So you would see there already uh, hints of travel. And we know very well that, uh, or you know now, that uh, Haran is part of uh, that uh, part in Mesopotamia, also Ur. And then they came down to Canaan. Now Ur is identified as Abraham's homeland. Near Ur was Uruk. That's in Erek in Genesis 10.10, 10, whose king was Gilgamesh. That's from 2800 BC. And uh, who was that? The hero of the flood story. You look at Genesis 6 to 9. Of course, in uh, Genesis, you would find there Noah. But in the epic of Gilgamesh, there was also the flood story that is very similar to the one in the Bible. Sumer, I've heard of this first when we were in taking history, world history in high school. It's the region of the Tigris-Euphrates basin near the Persian Gulf, also called the land of Shinar or Senar. The Sumerians were the ancient non-Semitic occupants of the region. And the Akkadians from... Chirka, if you say if you see CA, that's Chirka. Chirka, 2500 BC, the Semitic people found in Mesopotamia. They were not invaders, but Westerners who coexisted peacefully. And the greatest of these Semitic dynasties was at Babylon. Then we have Mari and Nuzi. When Abraham journeyed north from Ur, two city states he would have passed. And so he was familiar with these places. And then Haran, the place where Abraham located after he migrated from Ur. And many scholars think that it must have been the original homeland of Abraham. Then we see Aleppo, Hamath, Damascus, Jerusalem. What is that? That's the caravan route. Aleppo was a very ancient city, in fact, founded. Imagine, 5,000 B.C. And both Ugarit, or Ugarit, called also Ras Shamra, and then Ebla, that's Tel Mardik, they have yielded numerous tablets important for the study of Hebrew. In fact, uh, before, before Ugarit was discovered, that was just last century, 
there was a very good uh, dictionary, the Brown Driver Briggs Dictionary, which was really a masterpiece. But now it has been superseded. Why? Because they have uh, already dis they have discovered Ugaritic, which lends a lot of important uh, discoveries as to the Hebrew language. But of course, uh, that will be a, that's another topic, and I will not dwell on it here. And then we have Canaan, the promised land. Migrating from Mesopotamia, Abraham made no immediate claim to the land of Canaan. Okay? So that's Abraham and the Fertile Crescent. Also Egypt, according to Genesis 12.10, Abraham goes immediately to Egypt. He reflects the movement of the Hyksos. Asiatic migrants who infiltrated peacefully and eventually ruled Egypt. A theory that the Hyksos were actually the Hebrews. Now, we go to another topic. And uh, it's just a swift survey of biblical history. Something that would be very useful for you. Not only in this subject, but in your scripture subjects. And of course, a knowledge of history uh, would be very important for anyone who would, uh, would of course, teach uh, Bible or even uh, the continuation of this, which is church history. And generally, you know, knowledge of history would always do one good. So, just to tell you know, that uh, when we study biblical history, okay, we look at space and time. That's actually our subject. Uh, biblical geography and archaeology. When we speak of biblical geography, much of uh, what we speak of is the space. And then archaeology would be time. But it's not just a chronological record of events, but an understanding of their causes and then effects, the consequences. And see, even from our point of view as believers, how does God enter into the picture? So we've seen this a while ago. Abraham lived around 1800 BC. Okay, so just uh, look at the what's in this slide. What are in the slides? A familiar scene in the life of Abraham, and then because he was from Mesopotamia, these uh, um, towers that that you would see. Okay, and you would know more about that when we study about about Mesopotamia, Ziggurat. And then uh, you see their maps. This is where Abraham came from. Ur. And so going up to Haran and then going down to the promised land. He, and uh, here you will see it uh, also. Okay. 1240 BC, we have Exodus and Sinai. When they left the land of Egypt, that's in Exodus 19 to 20, uh, that's Exodus 14 to 15, one of the earliest parts of the Bible is in Exodus 15. While Miriam took up from them ref the refrains, sing to Yahweh for he has covered himself in glory, horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. And then Exodus 19 to 20, we see Yahweh descended on Mount Sinai in the top of the mountain and Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went out. And then we also see in 1030 BC, Saul, first king of Israel. Okay, You find there, uh, not only Saul, but look, remember the year 2000, uh, the year 1000. Very easy, uh, 1000 BC of course. Capture of Jerusalem. David is king of Israel and Judah. If in 1030, Saul became the first king of Israel, in 1000, David becomes king. So see there, David, king of Israel and Judah. So this is still the time of the United Kingdom, not the United Kingdom that we have now in Great Britain, but the United Kingdom 
of Israel when it was not yet divided. And 970, you have Solomon. In 931 BC, you find the division of the kingdom. After Solomon's reign, then it was divided. The kingdom of Israel in the north of Ephraim, you, you call it the northern kingdom or kingdom of Israel or kingdom of Ephraim. And you see it there in the that part which is blue, this part. And uh, also, you would uh, read in 1 Kings 12.20, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they summoned him to the assembly and made him king of all Israel. No one remained loyal to the house of David except the tribe of Judah. And see there, the kingdom of Judah is here in the south. Now, in 722 BC, there's the destruction of the northern kingdom. Just take note now, this is one of the dates that I would ask you to memorize. 722 BC, the fall of Samaria, destruction of the northern kingdom. Earlier than that, 734 to 732 BC, we have the syro ephraimitic War. And we have personages from the kingdom of Assyria, to lead the empire, we have Tiglat Pileser and then Sargon the second. And there you see a map of the time of the Assyrian, Assyrian Empire. And then another date that I ask you to memorize: 587 BC. That is the fall of the Southern Kingdom and the exile to Babylon. And you would find there Nebuchadnezzar the second, king of Babylon. And then later on, later in uh, 539 BC, you have the Cyrus Cylinder. This, is a, ex, this was excavated, an artifact. And we uh, know that at that time, Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon. And then he set free all the exiles. 332 to 323 BC, the reign of Alexander the Great. Okay, very easy to memorize the date, 332 and 323. And uh, there you have the reign of Alexander the Great, how uh, prolific he was as a leader, reaching even the East. One eighty-seven BC, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes who reigned from 187 to 164 BC. And uh, this is very important in intertestamental studies. Also, very important when we study the book of Maccabees, the books of Maccabees. In 198 BC, the Seleucids take control of Palestine. And one of the things that we read is in 2 Maccabees, verses, uh, chapter 9, verse 9 is this. In that very eyes of this godless man, teemed with worms and his flesh, rotted away while he lingered in, on in agonizing pain, and the stench of his decay sickened the whole army. Well, this is a description of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, because they despised him, the Jews despised him, because he persecuted them. 63 BC, we see Pompey. It's the beginning of the rule of the Romans in Jerusalem. And so Syria becomes a Roman province around the year 64 AD. No, that's 64 BC. Okay, you should correct that. 64 BC. And there, 63 BC, what do you find? The Hasmonean Dynasty. We find names like uh, Mattathias, Simon, Judas, and Jonathan, the brothers. And then you have John Hyrcanus, Aristobulus, Alexander Janaeus, then Alexandra Salome, Hyrcanus, Aristobulus II, Alexandra, Alexander, and then Antigonus, and then Antipater, the son of Herod the Great. Okay, and then you have Herod the Great, 
and the Miriam, and then you have Aristobulus. So Herod comes from this family. But uh, famous among them is Judas Maccabeus, who figures a lot in the book of Maccabees. Now, of course, you know this AD 30, around that time, the death of Jesus. And you find in Mark 37 to 39, But Jesus gave a loud cry, breathed his last, and the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The centurion who was standing in front of him had seen how he had died, and he said, In truth, this man was son of God. AD 49, you have the Council of Jerusalem. In Acts 9, 15, 9 to 11, God made no distinction between them and us since he purified their hearts by faith. But we believe that we are saved in the same way as they are through the grace of the Lord Jesus. And then AD 70, we know of the destruction of the temple. You should know this by heart. The first Jewish revolt was from AD 66 to 70. And by the end of that, there was the siege of Jerusalem by Vespasian and destruction by Titus. And around AD 80, there was the council at Jamnia, something that we will be studying, especially when we take the Gospel of John or even the, the writing of the New Testament. And that's very important. I will not tell you details about it. If you are interested, you could research ahead of time. Now, AD 132 to 135, you have the second Jewish revolt, and the, the leader of the Romans at that time was Hadrian, and then the Jewish leader was Rabbi Akiva, or Simon ben, Simon ben Kosiba, or Bar Kokhba. And according to Cassius Dio, 580,000 Jews were killed, and 50 45 town, fortified towns and 985 villages were raised. Imagine that. So you see there, there's this a brief survey of biblical history. Now, I'd like to go to our final, to my final word for today. You see the class is not as long as when we have face-to-face, -face, but uh, this is the first assignment, okay? So review the Review today's presentation on the Fertile Crescent or Ancient Near East. And then please watch the following videos on YouTube. Okay, so they're listed there. And then after that, after having done that, don't worry, they're not long videos. After that, write a short report of 300 to, 350, uh, 300 to 350 words only. That's very short. On the nature, what should it be? It's, uh, you put it in a, in a nutshell. The nature of the f Fertile Crescent, how it is related to the ancient Near East, and its significance to biblical studies. Okay? So it's nature, how is it related to the ancient Near East, and its significance to biblical studies. And this should be submitted not later than 10 p.m. of August 18, 2020. That is... Tuesday next week. And then the other one is this. There. Assignment number two. Review uh, today's presentation on a swift survey on biblical history. Then make your timeline, basing yourself on the line below. Look at the line below. From 1800 BC to 132 to 135 AD. So make your timeline. Feel free to add more events. You may use traditional materials, pens and paper, and then scanning it or making a good copy through a photograph, or drawing this using the computer. Be creative. And you submit it. Okay, I think it could be good in uh, either in PDF or JPEG. And this should be submitted not later than 10 p.m. of August 18, 2020. And that's next week. Okay? So that's, uh, those are the two assignments. And I hope that uh, you were able to follow the lesson for today. I'll be putting this as PDF and then sending it to you 
through Google Classroom. And this recording, I will also be sending to you. And with that, I would like to call it a day. And I, I'm enjoying this. Uh, this is the first time that I'm teaching Biblical Geography and Archaeology. I owe very much to Father Gian Cabrido, who was my teacher in this very course. That's why I'm able to take a lot from what he has given before. And uh, of course, from my master. No, I pass it now to my students. So I end this uh, lesson today with a short prayer. Entrusting ourselves to our Blessed Mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, have of Christians, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good day. God bless you all.